Welcome, my friends, to our 11th session in the Seminar of Self, which is hosted by yours truly, Tristan McGough, philosopher at large. And today, we're going to be carrying on from our discussion last time where we spoke of, of course, the aspects of mastery of choice leading to controlled change in one's life. Today we're going to talk about the necessity of self-control and wise choice, particularly leading to the fruits of transformation, and these fruits having, of course, certain results. Now, these results are what we're going to consider today because they've been considered from a number of different approaches by a number of different philosophical schools of thought and yogi methodologies, as well as mystic and contemplative traditions, uh, covered by theology and a great deal of philosophy, and of course metaphysics, ontology. But it's all based upon human nature. All self-transformation, of course, has to begin from a base, and the base that we have is what our nature is, what our human nature is. However, I have an expanded view of human nature, as do many other people who are omnis, whether they are transpersonal psychologists or perhaps theoretical cosmologists, or whether they belong to certain spiritual traditions or philosophical lineages. They have a very different conception of what constitutes human nature than traditional schools of Western thought, such as behaviorism, or even certain uh, depth schools of psychology that will deal with the psychological, deep psychic aspects of the soul, or what we've termed the epistic self and where behavioralism will deal with the empiric self. This expanded human nature, that is one's own cognostic constitution, what constitutes you and me and other human beings, Dasein, being here, being there. Having the being, which is forever being projected out of ourselves, but at the same time, is a complete mirroring witness of everything that occurs. This is traditionally, according to the perennial philosophy and omnism and omni-philosophy, divided into three realms. And these realms, we can say, from the Christian point of view, that we're all familiar with in likelihood, is heaven, purgatory, and hell. Purgatory is actually the transfinite realm of your own psychic enclosure. It includes your feelings and thoughts and ideas, your volitions, and all the mentations that occur and which are arisen from your own inner psychological apparatus. And that I've indicated here as the epistic self or the psyche or soul. And that's actually this ring here, which as we've spoken of early on, it's composed of intelligence, the mind, conscience, the will, and of course, sentience, which has to do with feeling, and vivacious, which is life. And these terms as well, as I've said, are encoded so that we see the agnostic self of Numa or the spirit, that is the united part of self, and the empiric self represented as two triangles, and where they are blended is this epistic self, which I've represented here as a circumscribed circle, appearing more like a plane. And that, of course, relates to the liminality of consciousness. That's where you are surfing on the ocean of consciousness as a engaged human being in the world, whether it's perception or conception, whether it's action or production. Any of those four compartments necessarily engage you in the larger world. So I've utilized that as a boundary line, if you will, and that's really where the epistic self 
exist. And that, remember, is the transcendental ego. That is the conditions that must exist for you as a personality, even to have the coherence, for instance, to speak or breathe or to carry on a normal conversation, uh, to do any of the things that you normally do in waking life. There has to be preconditions, possibilities that are structured. And this is your deeper self, often called your higher self. And this here is what we're referring to as the epistic self or the psyche or the soul. Where actually the empiric self is what I refer to as soma, coming from a Hindu word referring to lunar or the material side of life and consciousness. And the pneuma, or the spirit, is represented by the upper triangle. We can translate that here in, term, in terms of an expanded view of what the human constitution actually is. Many of you who are familiar with theosophy or other elements of modern esotericism, such as uh, the arcane school and Vedanta, Advaiti Vedanta may be familiar with seven planes of being. They're divided up, and actually it's all matter, whether it's the dense matter that we, that we see manifested to ourselves. Remember, we're only seeing a slice, right? We see a slice only of the visible. We're only touching that which is local. Everything is pretty constrained or constricted as far as the human individual as an empiric being is, is involved down here. And so this realm here of the pratic self, the psychic self, and the pneumic self, alternative terms, of course, for the agnostic and the epistic and the empiric selves, all different ways of looking at the same kind of structure of reality and we're not actually looking at the reality itself when we're looking at any of these maps. For instance, this map of the mind, this cognography of human existence, I, I represent down here, here's the physical plane, and divided into two portions, basically the portion we see, the manifest biotic realm, and the vital realm, the subatomic realm particle realm. These two realms are represented here by just the furthermost triangular down pointing of the octahedron. None of us for a moment think that I've captured the entire physical world, the universe, and all the galaxies within by simply referring to this physical plane as represented by these two levels here divided up as the vital and the biotic of the finite realm. However, that map allows us a way to orient ourselves within the cognoverse, within the universe which not only has a dimension of being, whether it's finite being or, or infinite being, but also has, as we've discussed, conscious being. Because reality, as a recipe to remind you, is neither being by itself, whether it's finite or infinite, nor conscious being by itself, nor non-being. But non-being, pure being, finite being, and conscious being are the four ingredients to the recipe of reality. And these are engaged in every moment, in every way, and particularly represented in the present, which, of course, is the gift from the universe to each of us as a conscious being. As we unpack it and we see what is presented to us, we have the things that become the contents of our experience, whether it's the telia, which are related, of course, to your will, or the basic ideas called logia, from your mind or the vidya, that is the dynamic impulses of your vital body, and qualia, that is the things that you actually sense, the essences that you feel and that you interpret. 
So in the expanded view of human nature, we can look at the traditional theosophical planes, which I've represented here. You'll notice that it is divided, according to Helena Blavatsky, as the Adi plane and the Anupadaka plane, which is basically the Logoic realm and where the first manifestations of us as individual sparks of beings, as monads, originate. And of course, I relate that here to the hypostases of self, relating to psiatis, nisus, esthesis, cognosis, and vivus, which we can translate quite simply, psiatis is self. And nisus is will, esthesis is feeling, cognosis is mind or thinking, and the last that is referred to as vivus, we have also termed life. So you know what I'm speaking of philosophically. We utilize those terms as technical jargon, but for the rest of us, we've referred to it in the past as simply the self that is at the center here. Let's take a look once again, very quickly. The self will mind, feeling, or heart, and your action, doing, your life. And these are all color-coded, and as we've spoken of them before, they are the very faculties of self by which you are going to transform the various elements of your normal, everyday waking life of willing, thinking, feeling, and doing into something which becomes superlative leading to your happiness, so that your will becomes empowered, your mind becomes enlightened, your heart becomes endeared and endearing, and your life becomes emancipated. This sense of self-transformation that first arises within the individual person is based upon the natural reflexivity of consciousness, where we have the ability for self-reflection. We not only have the light of consciousness, the light of consciousness can be reflected, and it can be reflected directly to ourselves in an intuition. It is reflected in terms of self-reflection when we become an object. We're the subject but we become the object of our own considerations and our own minds, such as when we ask, who am I? And of course, then it becomes reflected in the things that we do. For instance, this philosophic art that I produce is reflection of my mind in the empiric realm. Just like when I think about these things in a conceptual fashion, in an imaginative fashion, without any sensory input, at that point, then what I am accessing is an object, albeit a mental object. And this is what I refer to as the contents of experience. This is exactly what you are dealing with when you transform yourself at that liminal line, that is when you take hold of yourself and say, I am conscious of being conscious. You walk through the door and immediately have the potential as a micro self-transformation in order to point your consciousness in any direction in which you wish to pivot. That's important because that is that point or fulcrum of choice we spoke about. And Making a choice is one thing, but the context, the constraints, the tendencies, the predispositions that structure that choice is another matter. And it's with that we discussed last time in terms of the obstacles or the cis formations, that is, those things that bind you and keep you in cyclic stories. Cyclic stories are based upon the way the faculties operate in this world. In this world of 
space, time, cause, and entities, we see that our mind considers all the shaped elements that are situated in space. And those are what I call sections. We only consider sections perceptually or even conceptually or even in terms of action. We do it in sections. We do it in a section of space with particular elements at hand. And we're quite familiar with these, and the way that we handle these is through the mind. In the same way that the will handles what we call time. And that aspect of time is sequenced events that are initiated in the eternal now, giving us a sense of sequence or spans. So the way that the mind cuts up reality into sections of space, the will cuts up reality into spans of time. It's those spans of times that we identify with when we say, well, I did such and such for so long and so long. And in the same way, we can take a look at the other stories or the cycles that we create around our sense of self within our noia, within our, what I call, noticia ideata. That is our own self-produced ideas. I, noia can arise because you're stimulated from the outside. Well, that's noticia aleto in the old terminology of Tommaso Campanella. It's, in Descartes' terms, it's adventitious. It's what stimulates you, and then you have a reaction or a response as a sensory organism, whether with the photons impinging upon the retinas of your eyes, or whether the chemical compounds, which are odorants that trigger the sense of smell. All these things are adventitious. They come from the outside. But then there are things that are factitious. There are things that we all create just because we have consciousness which is self-generating. So when we have a mind in which we can entertain and occupy ideas, we can create things that have no reference to reality except they may be confabulations, they may be confusions where you're fusing different things together that before you wouldn't even juxtapose, juxtapose, you wouldn't even touch up against one another, but yet we do this all the time so that even in our minds we can entertain a contradiction of, for instance, belief or we feel one way and we think another and we will another and we do another. These can all be contradictory cognitions that occur within us. And of course, happiness is when you attain the harmony of the contents of consciousness. And that is when each of these stories or cycles, whether they're spans or spans of time or sections of space through the mind, spans of time through the will, scenes that we create out of our sense of establishing essences and entities. In other words, that's a man, that's a dog, this is a board, that's a carpet. These are all essences. The essence of the carpet being something which is a textile upon which one walks or uh, is quite different than the essence of a human artery and which is embodying, for instance, flow and the uh, intake of nutrients and their passage to living cells where the carpet, of course, is not doing that. So that's where we have certain scenes. So I have a scene of a carpet. And when I talked about the blood rushing through my veins automatically, there's an imaginative scene that pops into one sense, uh, uh, sensibilities. That's because besides a sense of time and a sense of space, we have a sense of entity. We identify things rightly or wrongly, we reify them, and we establish them based upon 
what we think are their essential characteristics, what we feel they are as essential characters in space and time as an entity. However, space and time and entities that are giving you sections of consciousness interpreting reality or spans or scenes is not all. These happen in a series, right? Cause and effect. The cause comes before the effect. It's different than the effect, but it can't be that different because it is related to that particular effect. We'll go into causality at another point. However, it's important to understand at the moment that there's more than just individual causation. I don't just cause things to happen and the environment causes things in me that I respond to. It's not just an individual matter. There's also collective causation, in which involves groups. Um, that can be the poisoning of a whole group of trees by a chemical plant that happened to set up operation downwind. Or it can be any kind of collective grouping, whether it's biotic or whether it's social, whether it's uh, atomic and molecular. It doesn't matter what the kind of grouping is. There is a collective causation that is as important in the consideration of reality as it proceeds causally in a series as individual causation, local causation, just between the particular entities that are involved in a local context. As subatomic and quantum theory have pointed out, uh, information can be acausally exchanged among quanta that are not even near <laughs> each other in any remote way through what is called uh, in, of all things, entanglement. And as you see, I put entanglement right down here in terms of the uh, physical realm because we are all influencing things around us and things distant from us in ways of which we are totally unaware, and that's due to the three realms in which we inhabit. We are not just involved as creatures in the normal linear cause and effect material uh, causation that's occurring here, but as quantum physicists have instructed us in terms of their theoretical interpretations of reality, we are dealing with a whole new set of causa causal principles when it comes to the subatomic world in which entanglement is one of them. That is the simultaneous exchange or understanding or registration of data or information. Regardless, what we are doing when we are looking at self-transformation is we're taking a story that we create and that we cycle through our personality. And that is that it's called vikalpa in Hindu terminology. It's this whirling thought, this modification of the mind that has no substantial correspondence to reality whatsoever. We are always engineering new stories about ourselves and about reality, about the people around us, and we do that by looking at them and interpreting them in terms of sections of space, spans of time, series of causal relationships, and scenes of entities. And these are all blended together through experience and fashioned into cyclic stories, stories that constantly go around these are nothing more than the process of what I've called are the obstacles to self-transformation. And to recall, just for a moment, when we looked at the net of nescience, the net that keeps us deluded, we saw that at the center of the self was delusion, or avidya, ignorance, primal ignorance. And the problem with ignorance it isn't that you don't know what's real, is you superimpose an idea of what you think is real. Happens at the same time. Nature abhors a vacuum. You, it's, the same, it's the same truth psychically. 
you don't just deny reality when you do not have a clear conception of reality. You superimpose your own representation of reality, your own understanding of reality. And therefore, this primary delusion is at the center of all the others, whether you're being distracted in the causal sequence of things and you're not able to get things done, or whether you're being diverted because of purposelessness in your life and you lack the will and the resolve and the orientation in order to accomplish goals, or whether it's doubt, that is, it's indecision, you can't actually decide on what the structure of reality is and which path you're going to take, or whether it's desire, which of course is a limitation of the love that you naturally could have toward every being and creature and thing in the world. You could appreciate everything. You have the capacity to be grateful for the things that are around you, whether they were given to you, taken by you, or neutral to you. The sense of gratitude is something which is an activator of the heart. Desire limits that natural universal compassion and loving kindness that we all instinctively have, we all intuitively have, and instead, we begin to interpret things in terms of our eros, our individual self-goals rather than agape, rather than that sense of brotherhood and doing for your neighbor as you would do for yourself. Anyway, these various things that we're talking about, of course, down here in the bodily level, it's disease, and up at the top in terms of the spirit, as long as you are not utilizing the fully expanded constitution of the human being, you're not looking inward, or as some might say, upward. That is, you're not actually beholding the divine capacities that you have in terms of your cognostic constitution as a deity, whether it's a goddess or whether it's a god, whether it's somebody that you interpret as having that aspect of animus or anima in Jungian terminology. Regardless, that kind of bifurcated understanding of what you are as either a man or woman in the human realm is to be understood that these all have facets and in every one of us as a human being we have a feminine and a masculine aspect that when one is transformed flames forth as charisma. And charisma is nothing more than the integration of the polarities that exist and constantly pull us all apart. And until they're integrated into a harmony, which is eudaimonia, or happiness, we are constantly finding ourselves either being divested of this, that, or the other thing. The worldly life forfeits our inward-facing self that we all can attain to through the awakening mantra and that we can prolong through meditation, which, remember, means to be at the center. So when we're talking about changing stories or cycles of existence where you're simply repeating the same thing, remember samsara means to wander. Pilgrim means to wander. Somebody who is wandering in the empiric realm without any guidance of their true self and understanding that they have a fully expanded trigonic self where they have an epistic or psychic element where they have a complete creative faculty, they have a logical and rational faculty, they have a faculty that appreciates the best out of life all of these, and they have vitality that they can call upon and ignite at any time and put into a planned approach that applies these different things to reality and makes a change. When these changes are made, and if you actually think about it, you do repeat, right? The days repeat themselves, 
But everything takes place in a spiral, not actually in a cycle. Cycles are our interpretation of life. They're the way that we reduce moving reality to static pictures. Cycles just mean that we're repeating to ourselves by way of feelings and thoughts, the same thing. And of course, that's habituation. You get quite bored with that as consciousness and as an embodied consciousness particularly. And you look for other things to do, and so you flutter and flitter about. However, along a yogic line, you are looking to unify and assemble those energies to consolidate them at the center. That is, for you to take control of them so that when you need to choose and respond to the challenges in your environment, you have an arsenal of talents, a repertoire of skills upon which you can call. And these are very important. These skills are developed as 10 types of intelligences, which we've talked about several times before. But just in a quick review, when you are transforming your life, you're filling it with purposeful activities. And these purposeful activities are going to be based upon your strong suit. That is, the cognitive things that you're best able to do. And besides the general intelligence that we all have in meeting the challenges of life and resolving them with the principle of requisite variety, that is, we have a number of responses to any challenge. If, if we have a challenge of what to eat, we think about what to eat, we see what's available, we think about whether we would like to go out, dine in, dine out, whatever. But we begin the processes and we start thinking in that way. General intelligence, we all have it, we all do it. But that same person who's going to decide whether or not and what they're going to eat might be a skilled musician, in which case they have a natural musical skill or special kind of intelligence, an audio intelligence, a smart. And as you've seen here, I've listed the 10 special types of human intelligence. And just to review, there's visual, which is the picture smart, such as in visual and graphic artists. Painters, air traffic controllers could be put under there, plus visual forensic analysis. Uh, by detectives or uh, by labs. Uh, linguistic or word smart, logical number smart, kinesthetic body smart, such as with athletes in sports, bodybuilding and sculpting, dancing, hatha yoga, tai chi, all that kind of thing. Naturalists, of course, nature smart. These are your ecologists, anybody, whether it's common or scientific, naturalist in ecology, as well as echistics, that is, people who are looking to integrate the best way to achieve the blue zones or happiness zones in uh, life, to build that in an urban setting that's integrated completely with the natural environment. It is not a blight or a sore upon the environment. It is totally integrated into it, much like those of you who are familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright and his building of shapes that were designed to mimic and highlight the landscape, and the materials were taken from the environs in which it was built. So as we continue down, there's also, as we mentioned, musical intelligence as well as existential, and that is, that's life smart. That's a person having common sense, street smarts, and the lessons learned. There are some people that learn common sense lessons swifter, thoroughly, more profoundly than others of us, and they have existential or life smart. Then there's interpersonal, that is people smart. This is your social IQ. But there are people, of course, such as uh, therapists and socialites and mavens who specialize in this kind of interpersonal special intelligence and knowledge. And then there's intrapersonal. That is, of course, when we spoke of self-realization, there are the ten dimensions of self. It's when a person becomes familiar with all those dimensions, whether those dimensions are uh, bodily or emotional or uh, volitional. We'll get to that a bit in a moment. 
but what's important is that you understand all of us are more or less familiar with uh, ourselves. Each of us, in other words, has a certain level of intra-psychic or intrapersonal intelligence, just as all of us have all these kinds of intelligences, but some of us are at the low end. We may have it a musical appreciation. We have a, a good sense of, of musical ear. We know what we like. In fact, we even might have an interest in various forms of world music. And so we expand our musical intelligence. However, somebody who actually plays music or composes music might have a deeper musical intelligence. These are all lines of development. And the last is the transpersonal, or what I call cosmic smart. That's an individual who sees the big picture, whether they're a cosmologist or a philosopher, as I refer to anybody who is looking in a non-dual way at the unity of life in the universe as an omnist, omni meaning all. Uh, the one and all, we spoke of that before. So when it comes to transformation and self-transformation at that, and remember, it's not just the self-realization, it's the self-cultivation. It's where you literally cultivate in the gardens of yourself the virtues that are going to be everlasting endurances. So when it comes to changing one's stories into spirals, as you can imagine, you are no longer using your noia, that is, the contents of your own psyche, your own ideas. You're no longer using that in order to represent how you really are. The way you are, according to the recipe of reality, is what you have become through deliberate willing, mindful thinking, appreciative feeling, and focused acting. When you are aware of what you are doing, you create different character patterns. And we discussed this the last time when we were outlining how the things that happen in the empiric self or as the personality in our attitude and our behavior impress themselves over repetition and intensity to become very deep volitional formations, some scars, as it's called in Hindu terminology, that affect whatever you're going to do in the future. They are your well-formed predispositions of character. We spoke as well, very briefly, about self-transformation as moving through the various needs. That term from the basic needs of having a nutrient sufficiency, and survival, right? And then your safety needs, your social needs, and your dignity needs, which include self-esteem and respect from your community, your elders, the people around you. But you get to a point here, again, this is the liminal point here. This is the point where you're grabbing hold of yourself as the psychic self, as the epistic self, as the self that understands the duality that you are a subject and whatever you behold as an object. You understand this epistemic relation. You cannot have an idea. You cannot have an odor that becomes something that you are conscious of unless you have a sensor, something that is going to allow something to be sensed. And you have, at the same time, that you have a sensor, you have a sensum. You have something that can be sensed. This is the subject-object duality 
this bifurcation of consciousness, which is innate in all of our dealings as the empiric self, because it is part of the transcendental ego. It's part of the conditions, the psychological conditions that make experience possible. You cannot have experience unless you have an experiencer that is experiencing the experienced. So, as you move through the hierarchy of needs, of course, then you're going to be developing these higher functions upon which we are today uh, basing our conversation as the result of self-transformation. Very importantly, in terms of the results, there have been many traditions that have said, well, after you've gone through the process of growing up, and then you wake up, and then you begin to lift up others around you, what are the actual results? What can you look for from these fruits of wisdom, virtue, bliss, and skill that I've said accrue as, of course, here, I refer to it as the goodness, truth, power, and beauty. And we've used these very often as other ideas that were spoken of in terms of how you cultivate the gardens of your experience in order to attain the highest aspect of each of your faculties, whether it be mind, will, heart, or life. The best way that one can describe what is occurring in that process of transformation is making happy thoughts, happy noia, happy contents of experience and feelings and willings. And happiness here is not a feeling, because that, of course, belongs to the appreciative feeling aspect or the quality of that you have within the heart. That's, that's the feeling aspect. It's more of a harmony amongst all the faculties that are working together. Because remember, you are never willing alone. Willing, thinking, feeling, doing, it all happens at once. It's all part and parcel of what it means to be a self. When we speak of these spheres, these are nothing more than cognographs. We are attempting to capture and represent what is occurring cognostically, that is, what is occurring in terms of consciousness. And consciousness, as you can tell, spans not just what's going on in your sensory world, in your body, but also what's occurring in your psychic world, in your mind, your psyche in the world, the world of the soul, where there you have creativity, where there you have rational, logical abilities, where there you have a sense of deep appreciation and gratitude in terms of the heart. And we're there. There is a dynamic reserve of unstoppable energy, which becomes your fountain of life. So when you transform, you're finding yourself with the various fruits of insight from mind, and bliss and serenity, and I think I've, yes, I've listed these here in terms of the sagas. A saga becomes, it's a cognitive evolutionary expansion through self-transformation. And so every time that you actually practice an appreciative feel, feeling, that yields delight. That is, that's a micro transformation right there that wants that you would reinforce it again and again and again as an operation more than a practice of your life, it will result in bliss and in serenity. And so you have the same things that spiral within the mind as mindful thinking generates discernment, and that is insight into reality. 
This is an integral sagacity. It's where you see yourself interrelated with other things. You understand why that is. It's not just that the rational faculty is used to come to a judgment. That judgment itself places itself within the wider context of understanding in the mind, and where the various noia, the various mental contents, are all harmonically related to one another. When you have that kind of harmonic relating within the heart, you have bliss, you have at the same time serenity. Bliss is serenity. The point is that serenity, that absolute peace, and the bliss is the reverberation throughout every aspect of your being of that peace. It is where you have serenity in action. And in the same manner, your focus acting causes dynamis, that is, this accumulation of living energy that allows you to have an auspicious, a beneficial service to those around you, which is the essence of lifting up and of caring, not just for yourself but for others. Because in the final analysis, none of us as an ego is a construction of the individual self. It is, we are all integral aspects of the collective self, of a self that we participate in, willingly or not, through beliefs and various sanctions that we've uh, accumulated and that we've assimilated within ourselves. These are things that we are changing because one must remember that these very modifications of the mind, these contents of consciousness, these noia, these ideas that are spinning around in your head as feelings and thoughts and willings and resolutions and as actions that you're aware of in your life, all of these things either can be harnessed into the lines of least resistance and swirl around in a cycle, in an empiric cycle that you repeat banal with banality day upon day with a boring consciousness. Otherwise, they can be spiralically transformed through the various techniques that we've talked about so that what is yielded is wisdom and the mind and the others. Result means to spring forth. It's what unwinds. And now, I want to take a look just for a moment, at what the Buddha says are the results. He says there are seven good qualities that results when one transforms the five aggregates of body, feeling, thinking, willing, and consciousness. The first is faith. The second is moral shame. The third is your fear of wrongdoing. The fourth is learning. The fifth is energy. The sixth is mindfulness, and the seventh is wisdom. So, those are all things that we understand quite clearly. We understand what it is to have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That is, from our very being. the consciousness of the being we have at the moment, that self-evident certainty of consciousness is the bedrock of faith. It is where conscious being meets being. That faith, that energy of consciousness recognizing itself leads to, eventually, these other elements we're speaking of, including moral shame, where you understand exactly where it is you could have done better. Well, if you have a sense of where it is you could have done better through moral shame, it certainly leads to the next Buddhic observation, 
where the Buddha says, then you have a fear of wrongdoing. From that point forward, you've created within yourself the samskaras, the volitional formations that say, I'm not going to do that again. That kind of resolution is part of character. And it helps you orient yourself. And instead of it being a sanction that's imposed upon you from the outside in, and you feel forced to have to conform, it is something now which you realize is essential so that you can orient yourself to the goal that you have in mind. And so those goals themselves are dependent upon what you are actually going to be able to harmonize in your mind, and you've got to learn to do that. So the next, after the fear of wrongdoing, is you learn. You learn how to develop skills, you learn how to become wise, you learn how to attain bliss, you learn how to practice virtue. But to do that, you need energy. So that's another thing that you're going to see in somebody who has attained to a level of awakening where you can go, ah, this is a good quality. This is something auspicious. The other is, of course, mindfulness. Mindfulness here is you're mindful of your body feelings, what's going on uh, as your thoughts, and then the other objects around you, whether they be inanimate or whether they be animate, whether they be in your natural world or in your social world. And the last is wisdom. That is, you have the skills of consciousness necessary to interact with reality. And reality happens to be composed mainly of collectivities, of groups. You're going to go home to a group of material beams and joists and walls and floors. You call a house. It's a group. It's an associated in here. It's a well-put-together group, but it's a material group. You have a genetic family to which you belong, a group. You have peers which you interact, again, a collectivity, a group. You have, perhaps, a church or a spiritual abode that you attend, again, a group. But besides having individual karma and group karma, besides having individual talents and group aspects, there's the holistic element. The group and the individual operates within the whole. Is it not true? Whether we build a city or whether we walk that city as an individual, we ourselves are planted firmly within the earth. And earth is planted however firmly, in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is planted within a universe that we find out daily is more amazing than we could ever imagine. So in terms of self-transformation, the Buddha says, look at seven good qualities that are going to mark when you've made some kind of transformation. When you've got faith, and you've got moral shame, a fear of wrongdoing, learning, energy, mindfulness, and wisdom. Those are good signs that you're what he calls a superior person. In the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha says, having fully understood the five aggregates ranging in the seven good qualities, which we just mentioned, those praiseworthy superior persons are the Buddha's bosom offspring. Having fully understood the five aggregates, ranging in the seven good qualities, those praiseworthy superior persons are the Buddha's bosom offspring. So attaining that position of superiority as an arhat, which means uh, a deserving one, is the chief goal in Buddhism, and there are many other kind of cessative yogic traditions that also look to the blowing out of existence here in the empiric realm and moving upward through 
the expanded human nature into the higher level of one's cognostic existentiality. But there are other traditions that list other kinds of results. And I thought another one you might be interested in is in the non-dual Shaiva tr tradition. There's called the state of being infused with the divine power, and that's basically of the anasic self, the infusion of that deific power into the human being is what's being spoken of. And it's described as always being present in the person who has achieved the goal and has awakened to their own awareness. And of course, you might remember Buddha Raja here that I've quoted from the very beginning because he gives us the key to self-transformation. And here, it refers to that awakening to one's own awareness. Now, from the latter scripture of the triumph of the alphabet goddess, I give you this quote. When that state of being infused by divine power is present, the following are the signs that one may observe. This, then, is the first sign, steady devotion to God. The second is successful attainment through mantra, giving immediate ev evidence of its efficacy. It is said that the third mark is awareness of all the levels of reality, all the tattvas. The fourth sign is the accomplishment of whatever tasks that are begun. The fifth is the ability to compose enchanting poetry and knowing the essential matters taught in all the scriptures, even without reading them, unquote. So these six signs of a comp, I, I divide them into six signs, and you see why. The last one, they're talking about uh, poetic capability. In fact, a chanting compositional ability. And then the next speaks of a meta-noetic ability, as I refer to it, where you actually know the matters of scripture, that is the perennial philosophy and its articulation in various scriptures, without having read the actual words. In other words, you have direct access to the concepts or the ideas that are the basis of those words. At the deep level, the deep structure, the structure of reality and here within what we were referring to psyche and realm rather than the somatic or the spiritual. So these six signs, the first is the meta-motivated. That is this motivation that you have, this devotion to God, this devotion to the ground, this to devotion to being, it's the primary goal of life. In fact, finding the unity in diversity is the lodestone to which all of our lives aim. And that's what we mean by happiness, attaining harmony at the individual level is happiness. Attaining it at the social level leads to social happiness, to social harmony. Happiness is usually an interaction of the individual with various collectivities creating that sense of community. And here, this is what we are speaking of in terms of the sagas when they eventually transform through just the individual karma of the practicing adept or arhat, they are somebody who then begins to lift up those around them. And they do this through the various senses that they have and which they've used and incorporated in their own transformation. So that in the socioverse, we are transforming the interdependent connectivity of the universe that pre-exists and that is existing now. We're all interdependently connected. And we are basically intentionally creating a cosmic community of conscious beings through the five sin causal contributions, as I call them, of awakened consciousness in an expanding utopian environments 
that sometimes are called the New Edens. The New Edens are actually places that are intentionally planned by conscious beings that have awoken. And these are being spotted across the planet and have been for quite a number of decades as we globalize our village even further. However, they always existed in Synovic communities before of monastics and other anchorites and Aramites, people who retired into the desert or into the caves, either communally or partly communally, and they pursued and achieved self-transformation. So the six signs that are being spoken of here in terms of non-dual Shaiva Tantra is your motive motivated, motivated. This is a term from Maslow, just like the next one that I use, metacognitive. You use mantras, that are tools of thought, such as the awakening mantra. I am conscious of being conscious. You use these tools, and they have an immediate efficacy. You immediately create a microtransformation. You utilize that in order to sustain through attention and through meditation your spans of time and your sections of space and your scenes of entities and the series causation of causation from stories into sagas. You live the transformative life by deliberate willing, mindful thinking, appreciative feeling, and focused acting. The next, you become meta-aware. According to Tantra, you become aware of the 36 tattvas. That is everything from the single ineffable one, the unity, through its division of Shiva and Shakti, the fundamental duality that imprints upon itself all of being as subject, object, this, that, here, there, before, after, cause, effect, light, shape, good, bad, etc., etc., etc. But the self-transformed one understands all that from the one right down to your physical senses and to the objects that he or she is dealing with. They have meta-awareness, so they have meta-motivation, meta-cognition, meta-awareness, and also they have a meta-effectiveness. They're able, once they start something, to accomplish it, to take it to its end. They're meta-poetic. They can condense concepts into the cadence of poetic syllables that have meaning, that render a vision, that offer an opportunity for expanded cognition, that is, for you to have your own saga of consciousness. And they're metanoetic. They're able to understand the perennial philosophy and the scriptures that speak thereof. Now, my formulation is this. Through the awakening mantra, you recall, you recollect your noia, your thoughts, the contents of your awareness. You call them all to the center of consciousness where they're consolidated. You generate that moment of consciousness in what I've called micro-transformations of self. They're immediately possible to your consciousness that walks through the door of self-awareness. Your consciousness then pivots whatever way you want. Most importantly, you can create inoya, these states of beneficial or auspicious consciousness. And these inoya are basically five. So my formulation is first you're going to use this awakening um, mantra, and you're going to open up inoya, that is beneficial noya. And right here I've listed the eudaimonic inoya. The first, the fundamental is Ur, like the city of Ur in the Bible. It's where Abraham came from, right? It's where everything had their origin. So often there's Ur speech with children or Ur syllables, etc., etc. Well, here it's Urnoya. 
that is, you are self-awake. You know that you have the light of consciousness. You reflect that light of consciousness internally as well as externally through your actions, as well as the way you interpret and represent reality around you. In terms of, let's go, let's go over here to pronoia. And that, of course, relates to the aspect of your life. Pronoia is a professional state of consciousness where you are so focused on what you're doing, you lose sight of everything else around you. You can be an accountant who gets lost in the sea of numbers and has to balance the books. You are in a state of pronoia in terms of your consciousness, your actions, when you are doing that, as an athlete will do, or somebody who's engaged in a good game of chess or tennis. It doesn't matter. You have pronoia. When it comes to the mind, this is dianoia. This is where not only do you focus on an idea, but you sustain the thought on that idea, and you investigate it from every side, and it continues over spans of time. It continues through sections of space. And what you are actually engaged in doing is this extension of thinking. This is dianoia. This is moving across the contents and binding them together, just as pronoia is that professional state of consciousness where you're absolutely engaged in what you're doing. Dianoia is you are absolutely engaged in what you're thinking. Kanoia, this is critical. That's wonder. That's absolute astonishment. That's when you are amazed at a sunset as you're traveling home. <coughs> and you have to pull over to the side of the road or you call attention to <coughs> pardon me, to somebody who's traveling with you. And you say, this is just amazing, or isn't that awesome? That's kanoya, that's wonder. And in the tantric tradition, it's called kamatkara. It's where you are just absolutely seized and divinely fascinated and thrilled with the spectacle. And that can be an internal one. It can be an external one. But that's another inoya. That's another good think, thought. That's another good idea, ideation, is Kanoya. And of course, then the fifth one that relates to will is what the Greeks called metanoia. And that is, that is a pivotal experience in life where you have a moral turning point. Things change for you. Things change for you because of your own applied efforts it's the results of virtue that are yielding what I've called dignity, that is accomplished sovereignty. And each of these spiral sagas are ways in which you're employing these eunoia, these happy ideations that you access at, through the awakening mantra wherever you are. You can have an appreciative feeling wherever you are. You can have mindful thinking whatever you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You can have focused action, activity on whatever you're doing. Whether it's meditating or watching television, you can focus on what you're doing. And not just be distracted and go somnolent. Not just go sleepy. Not just go mute of mind. But literally. Focus to the point where you have that sense of vivacity sparkling in your sensation. And you, at any point, can deliberately will what it is that you will do, including to deliberately will to enjoy your meal even more than you had the day before, because of the company you're with, or whatever reason is sufficient for you to deliberately will and to establish a higher sense of dignity. That is, this accomplished sovereignty. In the same way that the integral sagacity is the discernment of the mind, and the blissful serenity is the delight of the heart, and the auspicious service that you render the world through your dynamis, through this living energy, these are all indications in 
my formulation that you are awakening. The second is that these self micro transformations are cumulative and when regularly practiced and sedimented, they have lasting consequences. I call them everlasting endurances. They become the strata of your character that will generate macro self transformations. That is long term transformations. This metanoia that we refer to as a turning or pivotal point in your life where a great change is made. So the first of the micro transformations that allow you to access the anoya through the awakening mantra, that remembers that second element, that's metacognition, you have control of the tools of thought, such as the awakening mantra or anything that you choose to use as a tool for thought. The third, any and all self-transformation happens in the ocean, ocean of being. And any ripple, whether it's physically manifest, subatomic, vital, cognitive, affective, intellective, volitional, or any other type of being, has results that can be threefold based on the kind of interaction our dialogue taking place. I call this interaction dialogue. So no matter what you do at any time, there are ripple effects. There are consequences that take place not only individually within yourself, but collectively in your natural physical environment, in your social environment, and you also, in terms of your psyche, remember it is operating at a very subtle plane, but everything you do in your psyche, every thought and feeling and willing or res resolution or action you initiate has a ripple effect psychically as well as physically. Your body has an effect, albeit it's a local effect. I'm stirring some molecules around in the air at the moment, and I may be lifting a few physical items. I seem to have very little impact physically on my manifest environment at this moment. I'm having a huge impact in terms of the subatomic particles that are involved with the rigor of my rhythmic quaking and shaking as a body just in this physical world. So there are always results that are rippling. And you may feel something and go, well, that's not really affecting anything. Well, in the same way, I'm waving my arms around this room and I'm not affecting too much on the physical plane. But there is an effect that's taking place here. And there's a similar effect on the affective levels of reality and a similar effect on the intellective levels as well as the higher levels, including the intuitive and the volitional. So these results are the impacts your self-transformation has on other people and sentient beings, number one, and the environment that you inhabit and operate in. It. So that's where I was pointing out that you are not just having, for instance, as uh, an ego with your sense of I and other up here in the epistemic realm. And this is all material. And we can say that from one end to another, it's a finer grade of matter. And as the subatomic world shows us, these manifest things can be broken down quite a bit. But they're hardly the indivisible, indivisible atoms of Lucretius and Democritus. They are not indivisible, as we're finding. We're finding greater and greater divisibilities. Although we can account, our so cosmologists and uh, uh, physicists tell us, for the physical universe in terms of a formula. Remember, like any of my Cogno cards here, my cognistic cards, this philosophic art, it is a rendering. It is a representation. Does this, any of this allow you to move forward in your life and make transformative changes? If it does, it has a utilitarian purpose, and that's as it should be. Because in the empiric realm, the principle of utility, cause and effect, and uh, the advantage of fitting in and working properly 
is the ruling principle. Just as in the psychic realm, the ruling principle is the principle of felicity. And these principles operate in such a way that in this one, it optimizes the intrinsic worth, epistemic fusion, and self-transformation and intersubjective evolution. We are evolving with one another only because we are constantly in a collaboration with each other in terms of how we are going to span our time with worthwhile projects that are going to deliver a new reality, a new Eden, a utopia to us. Not a utopia, not some place that doesn't exist, not a dystopia where things don't work, not even a utopia where everything is perfect. It is a new and utopia where things are ever refreshed because they are everlastingly sourced and we understand the source as conscious human beings. When awakened human beings begin to take control of their environment as a collectivity, that's when we'll see the advancement of the socioverse. We'll see where things are no longer treated just as things, but they're precious things. Where people are no longer treated as just objects or consumers or something that uh, we choose to keep at arm's distance except for the few that are either genetically or affectively affiliated with us. Instead, we expand our horizons, we expand our hearts, we expand our minds, our wills, and our lives. And we do that through these principles on the empiric plane of utility of what is useful and skillful in the principle of felicity for the solar realms where what is important is cognitive consonance that allows us to collaborate and communicate with one another, to share a sense of aesthetic beauty and commune with one another, as well as to co-create the physical spaces that we inhabit, as well as the laws under which we guide and we govern ourselves. Self-transformation leads to the cultivating these three realms that we've referred to as the new Garden of Eden with its integrated fields of will, mind, love, and life, wherein the fruits of dignity, discernment, delight, and dynamis grow and re-nurture the universe that bore and fed the evolving soul. Individual beings have been waking up since the dawn of humankind. But as the Earth's people synergize their energies, efforts, and achievements, they will collectively build a new world. A world expanded psychically and physically, culturally and naturally and technologically, and oriented toward progressive, social, ecological, and holistic connectivity. Utopia is the social state of the global village as it attains a political, cultural, economic, and institutional equilibrium and harmony brought about by humans who have grown up and are in process of waking up or have achieved awakening, that is, eudaimonia. Awakening the attainment of happiness and end of suffering is a natural part of the fully expanded human experience. It's taking human nature and it is evolving, it is unfolding it. It is allowing it to unwind to have its results. And that comes about through self-transformation, which of course is self-realization and self-cultivation. In a similar way, we'll see the social transformation taking place as people realize the various dimensions of themselves, 
and they help cultivate it with one another. Individual self-transformation is generated in the Triganic self as it participates in a three-realm world of spirit, soul, and soma, or personality, if you will. Such participation of the fivefold conscious being through its instruments, that it's its faculties, capacities, capabilities, and sensibilities, on the seven main planes of being, which we've talked about very briefly, more alluded to than anything else, takes place in a variant wider context constituting those respective planes of being. Participation is an ontological dialogue conducted in three realms as what I call the anesologue. That's the dialogue of spirit, where the anesic self is dialoguing with the one self as I, I. In the words of Yahshua, I am my father or one. Then there is the ego log, which is the dialogue of the soul. That's the epic, that's the epistic self that's dialoguing with the collective self and the other people in that collective self as I, thou. I, thou. Such as, I love you. And then we have an ecologue, which occurs in the realm of Soma. It's the dialogue of Soma. It's the empiric self, dialoguing with the natural self as I, that, such as I hold this. This leads us to a reformulation of the ten dimensions of the self that we've spoken of before. And I want you to take a brief look here at these dimensions as they've been reconfigured in terms of the participation of conscious being in being as an ontological dialogue conducted as an anesologue, egologue, and echologue. There are two united dimensions. The identifying self, that's the self as the foundation and origin of the self, of all selves and of one self. This is the identifying self for the one self, as well as the advancing self, that is the self experiencing the present and all its fullness in terms of the present moment, the presented object, presentivity, which is the the potential of being able to be presented, and the actual presenting itself within the world. That assumes the one presence, which is presencing, and the presentation of an entire backdrop, a context, a world, if you will, in which all of this takes place. And that what brings us to the collective dimensions, and where we have an ego log. And that demands our perspectival self, where we're viewing from our unique psychobiotic position relatively, relative to the world as an observing self, as well as our bodily self. And it's two aspects with its passive senses, of course, as the passive, as the uh, sensing self, and the acting self with its five active senses. Now, this is the living or vital self. And then there's the social self, imagining how others see you in the world and in relation specifically to them, as well as all your imaginal roles and relationships. This is the imagining self. All of these are demand a collectivity. Perspective demands that you have a natural involvement with the world, whether it's the outer world of nature, or the inner world of the mind. You have a perspective. And that demands a collectivity, an interaction with other elements in the group. Bodily self is yourself, which is a part of the physical material and the vital world. And it depends upon those worlds and it interacts with them as part of a collectivity. And the social self, which is that 
culturally created aspect of yourself that allows you to share perspectives, which you would never do unless you had intersubjective relations with those people who have brought you up, educated you, and interact with you, either in business or daily life. And then there are the five individual dimensions that you exercise in your ecologue. And that's your enduring self, the continuing self you wake up to, your volitional self that wills, your narrating self that thinks, your emotional self that feels, and your organizing self that unifies all of these together so that they operate as a fully functional unit with a center of consciousness. So we are looking, in essence, at taking these holistic dimensions and the collective dimensions and the individual dimensions and harmonizing them. And this is what we're calling the path of ascent in self-transformation. And that literally leads you from the stages where you've grown up by developing into a mature human being. You've woken up as a self-conscious human being that can direct their own evolution, and you're lifting up by developing the necessary skills by which you become serviceable to the collective and the whole world in which your dimensions participate. So in the end, we are creating community. We are creating a socioverse. We are creating a world that is not only in our image, but is in a unitive image. It's in an image where the elements are harmoniously united with one another, and the essences, that is, the distinctive factors, are allowed to flow freely. And we do this from a perspective of appreciation and meditation and collaboration, as well as activation. Transformation really is about applying the fires of consciousness that devour the old cis formations and, like a phoenix, they are reborn as transformations. And I'd like to read for you uh, something that a Trappist monk, Thomas Merton, belongs to the Order of Cister Cisterians, pardon me, Cistercians, of the Strict Observance. The Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance. And Thomas Merton, in one of his writings, The Behavior of Titans, says this. Those who die the death of fire, the death which Christianity was to call martyrdom, and which Heraclitus definitely believed was a witness to the fire and the logos, become superior beings. Recall what the Buddha was speaking of with the seven qualities of a superior person. They live forever. They take place among the company of those who watch over the destinies of the cosmos and of men. For they have in their lives entered into the secret of the Logos. And this is quoting Heraclitus, the ancient Greek philosopher now. Merton says, or quotes, they who die great deaths rise up to become the wakeful guardians of the living and the dead. Unquote. Those who die great deaths rise up to become the wakeful guardians of the living and the dead. Merton continues and concludes. The aristocracy in which Heraclitus believed was not an aristocracy of class, of power, of learning. All are illusory. It is an aristocracy 
of the spirit of wisdom, one might almost say of mysticism and of sanctity. Unquote. This is a cosmic community, a socioverse. The results accrue to the self, to the group, and to the world at large. The universe becomes through community, a socioverse, where we can expect to be greeted by superior beings, whether from this planet or another. For today's self-transformational evolving practice, we're going to use step number eight, which is the self-transforming practice that is called Wonderful Dialogues. So if you would, take a look here. And for this, Wonderful Dialogues, step eight. I want you to remember participation of conscious being in the three realms of being consists of ontological dialogues. The anesologue, the dialogue of the spirit, the anesic self-dialoguing with the one self as I, I, as in I and my father are one. The egologue, which is the dialogue of the soul. This is the epistic self-dialoguing with the collective self as I thou, such as in I love you. And the ecologue, which is the dialogue of Soma, that is in the pistic self, dialoguing with the natural self, as I that, and that can be your body or anything in the material world, such as I touch this. In this self-transformational evolving practice, make these dialogic exchanges Wonderful, that is filled with wonder. Kamatkara, complete astonishment, total amazement, thrilling fascination. So, that's the pre, the prequel here to the actual exercise. First enter the door of self-consciousness through the awakening mantra. I am conscious of being conscious. Here's an example of metacognition. When in nature, consciously practice a dialogue with Soma by holding as precious some body, that can be a person, animal, plant, mineral, or other natural force, element, or phenomena, such as even a sunset or a sunrise. The mere I that encounter then becomes through wonder, I encountering a precious this. I precious this. That's the interface. It is not simply I that. It is I and precious this. When in culture, consciously practice a dialogue of soul by cherishing some child, friend, relative, stranger, or other person, or person in formation, such as a pet. The bare I-thou relationship becomes through wonder, I cherish thou. I am interfaced and at one with that which I cherish, thou. When in silence, consciously practice a dialogue of spirit by adoring some life, whether it's divine, human, or the advancing spirit of any sentient being. The unknown I, I becomes through that wonder. I facing the adored one. I adored one. Wondering as a micro-transformation in your life will give you a taste of the result of transformation, the light. The light helps one garner the other fruits of discernment, dynamis, and dignity. And through these, a vision 
of the social entity that I've termed the socioverse, that can arise within you where you become one who begins to lift up. You can get a sense of the wonder that awaits your awakened consciousness through experiential words and the metapoetics of a particular master that I have in mind, Paramahansa Yogananda, from a verse called the Cosmic Sea. It's found in his metaphysical meditations. And we'll conclude today with that quotation. When you find that your soul, your heart, every wisp of inspiration, every speck of the vast blue sky, and its shining star blossoms, the mountains, the earth, the whippoorwill, and the bluebells are all tied together in one chord of rhythm, one chord of joy, one chord of unity, one chord of spirit. Then you shall know that all are but waves in his cosmic sea." Unquote. So for the next time, we'll consider the life of transformation when we'll continue our talk on the socioverse, Newtopia, and the New Eden, as well as concluding our 12-part series on the Seminar of Self answering the question, who am I? So, until then, be good whenever you can. Though you behave when you must. But above all else, be yourself.